Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another amazing webinar. For those of you I've never met, my name is Kevin Thatcher. I am the founder and CEO of a title company in South Florida called Independence Title. And today we have an amazing webinar. Uh, I know I did a lot of promotion. I'll introduce Bob here in a second. We'll let him introduce his two amazing friends. Because honest, full disclosure, I didn't know much about his friends, but I do know anyone that Bob hangs around with and associates himself or, or amazing people. So when he asked me to put this webinar on, I, I thought it was just great timing uh, with what we have going on in the real estate market, with a lot of our, our new NAR ruling coming down with how buyer's agents are going to have to sell to their clients. Uh, so, so we just have some really great content, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end. A little quick story about Bob. We were trying to figure out the timing. Somewhere back around 2008, uh, I had a, a friend of mine, her name was Margie. Margie Casey was an appraiser in one of my networking groups, and she made a great introduction to a very large real estate firm. And those of you know, for a title company, having a real estate firm on your side is just a really great asset. And uh, a few years after building a relationship with her, uh, I was able to move in to be the exclusive title company for that real estate company. And I've been there now. Uh, over 18 years. So, you know, really great opportunity for me. And the way this connects to Bob is that Margie asked one time, she said, have you ever heard of the book, The Go-Giver, which if you've never read the book, this little red book here, uh, it's a very short read. She said, I would love to meet the author, Bob. And Margie has done so much for me over the years. I said, how could I not try and get her an introduction? So I, I reached out to Bob on Facebook and I told him the story and he said, absolutely, come up to Jupiter. I said, when? He said, tomorrow. So we were having dinner on a Friday. I said, Margie, you want to go up and meet Bob at, at Dunkin' Donuts on Saturday? She said, okay, no problem. Now she's read the book. I didn't read the book. So I ran to Barnes & Noble, picked up the book, stayed up all night, read the book, went up and met Bob. And the rest is really history because I was broke. I had no money. Uh, I didn't really have that much business. And... Bob really changed my life. And at the end of the conversation, meeting with Bob at Dunkin' Donuts, I was like, you're an amazing person because he tried to sell nothing. I'm like, do you have a program? And he says, well, I have something if you'd be interested. And fast forward, I signed up for his endless referrals and go-giver training certification program. I didn't do that as a business. I wasn't a go-giver coach training people, but I took that program and implemented in my entire network and taught people how the act of giving without the expectation of receiving can really increase your business. And I think today is a, a really still a great time, even though we fast forward many, many years later, that still in business, agents are going to have to sell to their clients a different way. There's going to be no more used car salesman pitch. There's going to be no more. It's an automatic deal. You are going to have to sell your value. And one of Bob's laws is the law of value. So, Bob, welcome today. I appreciate you hopping on uh, and appreciate you bringing your friends with us. Uh, my pleasure. Our pleasure, Kevin. And thank you for having us. And I just, you know, I hear your story and I just uh, it just touches my heart. And and thank you. And, uh, you know, I think I know you know this, but for everyone, just know Kevin is one of the people I call my real life action heroes. So uh, thank you. And, and you know, we begin looking, and I, I think what Kevin brought up, especially with NAR and with everything that's happening now, uh, that it's about relationships. But let's ask the question, are relationships really that important in today's world of sales, whether you're in real estate or anything else? I mean, shouldn't it just be you've got a good product, a good service, you know your stuff, and people need it or they don't, or they want it or they don't. So they logically just buy it and and that's it. I mean, um, what more could there be? Well, law number three, the law of influence in The Go-Giver, the book Kevin was kind enough to mention, the law of influence says your influence is determined by how abundantly you place other people's interests first. But again, is that just theoretical? Uh, can you hear me okay? Or is my is there an issue on my Yeah, end? it's fine. It was Kim feedback on Kim, so I just muted her. Oh, and okay. her when it's uh, All right. So, you know, is that just theoretical pap, placing the other person's interest first? Well, 
I want to share something very quickly. In his 2013 book, his bestseller called Give and Take, Adam Grant, a Wharton Business School professor, um, cited a, sur a, a study of financial advisors throughout Australia. And the study was this. They wanted to know what made the top producing financial advisors, and of course, this is what you used to call stockbrokers, financial advisors, people who help people create and manage wealth, and were really in charge of managing their entire portfolio, helping that person to, to grow their finances uh, for in the future. And to, you know, so it's a very big responsibility. What is it that, that distinguished those financial advisors so that they were the top money producing, money earning, okay, for themselves, money earning, okay? Uh, in other words, the best salespeople, okay, in the country of Australia. Here's the thing. Did they all have financial acumen? Absolutely. Did they all work hard? Sure they did. But you know what? That was not the distinguishing factor. That is not what caused them to be the highest money earning financial advisors in Australia. Because a lot of financial advisors had great financial acumen and they all worked hard, just like, you know, a lot of realtors who know real estate backwards and forwards. They know every uh, home in their, their community or farm or whatever. They've taken every real estate course. They have all these designations. They know what they're doing. It wasn't the financial advisors who just worked hard. You know, a lot of realtors who are out there all the time, they're at open houses constantly. They're constantly in the phone. They're knocking doors. They're doing their thing, right? That's not what distinguished them. Not at all. The top money earning financial advisors in Australia had one thing in common. All of them put the interests of their clients ahead of themselves and ahead of their own companies. And these were the people who earned the most. The law of influence says your influence is determined by how abundantly you place other people's interests first. Now, let me share something, if I may. Let me qualify that. When we say place other people's interests first, we don't mean you should be anyone's doormat or a martyr or self-sacrificial in any way. Absolutely not at all. It's simply that as Joe, the protege and the go-giver, learned from several of the mentors, and as I wrote in my first book, Endless Referrals, and had been talking about for years before that, the golden rule of business, of sales, is that all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust. And here's the thing, the, the, the fastest the most powerful, the most effective way to elicit those feelings toward you in others is by genuinely and authentically moving from that I focus or me focus to that other focus, looking out for the other person. Or as Sam, one of the mentors advised Joe, making your win all about the other person's win. Why is that so important? Why is it that that works? And, and really, here's the reason. And I think this taps very much into human nature. And I used to say this when I, I, I used to lead off my programs when I would, would speak at, at corporate sales conventions right back in the day. You know, I'd say, nobody's going to buy from you because you have a quota to meet. Right? Nobody's going to buy from you because you need the money. And nobody's going to buy from you just because you're a really nice human being. They're going to buy from you or in real estate, they're going to list from you or buy a home from you. And, and I know there's lots of other businesses on this, uh, on this call. They're going to do business with you because they believe that they will be better off by doing so than by not doing so. And in order for that to happen, they must first know you. It's good when they like you but they have got to trust you. And that trust comes both in the forms of competence and character. They've got to know that you have their well-being at heart, right? Uh, and especially when we're talking real estate, that is in and of itself a very emotional situation. We're talking about a, a house. We're talking about a home. That's emotional right there. So everything else that they've got to feel, they've got to know you have your best. That's relationship building. And it is so very uh, important. The way that we do that is really through 
understanding influence and what I call genuine influence. Now, very quickly, influence by definition is simply the ability to move a person or persons to a desired action, usually within the context of a specific goal. You want this person to trust you with their listing. You want this buyer to buy from you. Uh, that's fine. That's that's influence. It's the ability to, to do that. But there's a higher form of this, and it's what we call genuine influence. And genuine interest is a genuine influence, rather, is the ability to work with another person in such a way that they feel genuinely good about themselves, about the situation, and about you. And when you can do this, it helps you walk through the entire selling process from beginning to end. From that initial call, whether it's outbound, inbound, meet somewhere locally, a referral, what have you, through the follow-up, the follow-through, the relationship building process, the sales process, the referral process. There are five basic steps or principles to genuine influence, and I'm going to go through them very, very quickly today. The first one is to master your emotions. We must be able to control our own emotions because there are going to be things that come up from people telling us no to people having objections that we already feel we've answered three times to somebody who just can't seem to make a decision and yet all these different things that can frustrate us, right? And if they would only listen to us, we could help them. So we've got to be able to master our own. It's only when we can when we're in control of our own emotions that we're even in a position to take a potentially negative situation and turn it into a win for everyone involved. The next principle is to step into the other person's shoes, or what I call understand the clash of belief systems. A belief is simply the way another person understands their world. It's based on everything from a combination of upbringing, environment, schooling, news media, television, what have you. But it's pretty much etched in stone when they're little more than toddlers. This is for all of us. Most people grow up uh, with a, a set of beliefs that they had nothing to do with, with acquiring, and yet that's how they live their life. They, they, they operate through what I call an unconscious operating system. OK, what we have to understand, we and we may not even understand their beliefs. That's OK. We just need to know that often we're working from two different sets of beliefs. Three is set the frame, set the proper frame, or sometimes it's resetting the frame. Now, what is a frame? A frame is the foundation from which everything else evolves. So when you have set a proper frame, you're 90 percent of the way to agreement. Right. But. When another person has already set unconsciously, by the way, because people set frames uh, unconsciously typically, and it's a negative frame, now if you buy into that frame also unconsciously, you're 90% of the way to not getting the results you want. Let's come back to that and give an example. Let's go to the fourth one first, communicate with tact and empathy. My, my dad used to define tact as the language of strength. And I always love that because it can really take a lot of strength, right? To, to We got to really master our emotions to not just react at somebody at what they say, to not be defensive, to not put that position, that person in a position where they fit, right? And so I, I guess really you could define tact as, as the ability to communicate a message to someone who would normally not be open to that idea but do so in a way that not only are they not defensive toward you and resistant to your idea, but they're open to you and more accepting of your idea. Now, empathy, which is sort of the, the partner of tact, tact and empathy, empathy by definition is the identification with or vicarious experiencing of another person's feelings. The problem is we're not them, so we don't necessarily know how they feel. But here's what we can do. We can communicate, and this might be through what we say, how we say it, or even just how we show up, right? We can communicate that while we might not understand exactly how they feel, we understand they're feeling something, and that this something is distressful to them, and that we're there to help them through it. And then principle number five of genuine influence is let go of having to be right. Now, this doesn't mean you don't want to be right. 
It doesn't mean you're not prepared to be right. It means you let go of your attachment to having to be right or having to be 100% right. Now, when you're dealing with a, a prospect, a customer, a client, there's two great things that happen. First, when you let go of having to be right, you put yourself in the, um, in the learning mode, which means um, you have the opportunity to learn something you didn't already know, which is going to help you to be right more often. This is totally different from the person who, uh, whose life philosophy seems to be, my mind is already made up, don't confuse me with the facts right? That person can never know any more than what they know now. And a lot of times with people like that, uh, what they think they know probably isn't very true, right? So that's the first part. The second thing about letting go of having to be right is when your prospect really understands that you're not just looking to be right and that you're not looking to be right by making them wrong, but that you're simply seeking the truth wherever that truth may lead, now they drop their defenses. Now they feel great about you and they're much more likely to let go of their position in order to join you in that search for the truth. So we've gone through very briefly re Reader's Digest version of those five principles, but let's now go back to, we were talking about, uh, we were talking about the frame. And I, I want to use just one example here because the frame is so important. Remember, the frame is 90% of, of what's going to happen. So let's say, and again, I know there are other people other than realtors, but let's let just for this example, you, let's use a realtor. You're at a home uh, and you're there uh, on a listing appointment. And obviously your goal is to be able to have the listing by the end of the conversation. But when you get there, you notice the husband and wife seem to have kind of a an uncomfortable aura about them, almost almost angry a little bit. And you don't know why, but again, you're going to control your own emotions and you're just going to kind of wait and see. And when they when they come to the table, literally, because they're sitting at the table with you, and, and one of them says to you, hey, I just want to let you know that you're the fourth realtor we've seen. And uh, every one of them before you has told us that they're the best one, they're the number one, and their company is number one, and they're they're the only ones we should go with, and they just have told us, and we don't like it, and rah, 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 okay, and obviously that's, now, if you react to this, if you don't control your emotions first, right, if you're not the master of your emotions and you react, well, now you're defensive, maybe you start sticking up for yourself and your company, or you maybe begin to cower and kowtow to them a little bit, which also, you know, isn't productive, uh, or maybe you become even a little bit aggressive and say, well, this is, you know, whatever, and it's not going to work out well, okay, so instead we need to reset the frame. So what if you were to say something very simple, uh, such as, well, Mr. and Mrs. Parsons, um, I'm sorry you had to go through that. And I can only imagine how, how that would cause you to feel. Um, please know that while I've been honored to list and sell a number of homes in this community, whether or not I'm the right solution for you, we simply can't know without exploring deeper and really determining your needs, your wants, what you're looking to accomplish. So please know this conversation is for all three of us to really understand that. And if it turns out I'm a fit, uh, great. I'll be honored to, to you know, handle the listing of your home. But if not, that's also okay. Boom. So what you've done is you've totally reframed this from an adversarial type of relationship to one of two allies who are both looking out for their interest. And remember, it's their interest that they're concerned with, okay? And now notice, while we were talking about the reframe, we used every one of the five principles there. First, we we controlled our own emotions, right? We, we put ourselves in their shoes. We understood the clash of beliefs. We knew there was something going on there. There was a certain belief. Now, their belief was, you realtors are just trying to pressure me into listing with you because you want my money, right? Well, that was their belief. That was what they, and so third was reset the frame. Fourth was communicate with tact and empathy, which you did. The fifth was letting go of being right. In other words, you gave them an out or back door. If I'm not the right person, 
that's okay as well. This is what I call Berg's law of the out or back door. And that is the bigger the out or back door you give someone to take, the less they'll feel the need to take it. So you don't give them the outer back door in order for them to take it, which they would if they had to, but they would anyway. But no, you give them the out or back door so they feel comfortable enough with you that they don't feel the need to, okay? So now let's look very quickly before I hand this over to Jeff. You know, the the the, the parts of, of sales that all that all five of these have to be part of. First, it's it's what? It's knowing who you're target market is. Then it's meeting them, but not just meeting them. It's connecting with them on a heart to heart level. This is where the relationship comes in. Then it's the actual sales process. It's the sales discussion. And this is where the discovery aspect is the most important. What is selling? It's discovering what that other person needs, wants, or desires and helping them to get it. And again, to the degree that you have that relationship, that's the degree that you're able to be answer their questions, to be able and to be able to work effectively within their objections, not overcome objections. You can't overcome an objection. Why? Because nobody wants to be overcome. Nobody wants to be told that they are wrong. So we don't overcome objections. What we do is we work effectively within the objection in order to get to the actual root or heart of the objection, right? And then we work in partnership with our prospective client in order to advance the sale, okay? And then there's the part where you need to be able to complete the, um, uh, whatever it is, the listing or, or whatever it is. And then there's the part where after that, you need to be able to stay not only top of mind for them, but you need to stay top of heart so that, you know, when it's time for them to either use you again or just as importantly, refer you to others, okay? You're the only one that would ever come to your mind. And as Kim says, and she'll talk a little bit about this later, it's not your client's job to remember you. It's your job to be unforgettable. Now, first, I want to introduce uh, uh, Jeff West. Jeff was a uh, leader with a uh, Fortune 500 uh, insurance company for many years, starting first as a sales professional and then working his way up in a very quick period of time to state sales coordinator of Texas, which was a huge thing in this company. He was one of their top producers. He had a team of a couple thousand people or more, what have you. And it was, he was immensely successful. After he retired, he went back and he researched something. And I'm gonna let him talk about this, but it's one of the most brilliant things I've ever, uh, I've ever seen. And what Jeff does with this, just part of it, is helping you get to have more prospects agree to speak with you and have a sales conversation and then be able to really up your closing rate. And there's a science, there's an actual science behind it called fusion points, which he developed after he retired. And it is one of the most brilliant things I've ever, ever seen. So Jeff's been a great friend of mine for 20 years and I just love the guys like a brother. So I want to introduce Jeff West. Thank you, Bob. It is such an honor to be with you guys today. You know, as Bob mentioned, my branding, the training that I do is geared toward fusion points, create the, uh, the science of, of sticking to things. It's the way to make everything more sticky in your process. Uh, and what I do with that basically is it grew out of a of a interest I had and other state managers with the company that I was with had is how could you take two people who on paper look exactly the same. They should both be very successful in their sales career. And yet you put them out in the field of sales and one ends up deciding to persist and make it in their career. And another decides to quit and give up. And so in the team building process, I want to know that. But as I began the research, I found that it doesn't just apply there. It applies everywhere, whether you're prospecting, whether you're having that sales conversation and everything that you're doing. And I'm not going to go into the science today because of the limited time. But if you like doing research about what uh, about what comes together to bring these points today, uh, there's a gentleman named Dr. Antonio Damasio, professor of neuroscience 
at uh, USC and an adjunct professor at the Salk Institute. But basically, here's what I want to tell you. The single most important factor that is going to affect your future career, your future business, your growth, is not the economy. It is not the political landscape. It's not even really your competition. The single most important factor that will determine your future success is how the prospects in your marketplace, how your clients, how you're, if you're building a team, how your salespeople come on board with you, uh, your support staff. It's how they make one simple decision when it comes to their relationship with you and your company. Will they persist or will they quit? So understanding how that decision gets made is huge in your future. Because here's what it amounts to. There is a science, an actual neurological process that occurs in our brain with each and every decision we humans make. And there are no exceptions to that. And when we learn and choose to work with that science instead of in opposition to it, we can actually influence how some very important decisions get made. Uh, we can influence how a prospect whom we've never met will make that first decision to meet us. They will also influence how that same person then decides to become our customer and our personal walking ambassador. Uh, in a in a if you're building an organization, we, you can actually influence how that potential recruit makes the decision to come on board with you, and then even more importantly, stay after their career and persist. And as a, a team leader too, you can influence how your people become hugely loyal to what you're doing and your cause. And so basically, here's how that science works. In, in the decisions that we make. Every single one of them work basically the same way in the neurology of your brain. You have a part of your brain that creates emotion. That part of your brain is separate from the part of your brain that processes logic. But when it's time to make a decision, here's what happens. The emotional center of your brain communicates with the logical center of your brain, and together they give you the result. They give you a decision. Now, here's how it works. If we're experiencing a negative emotion, like distrust, uh, uncomf we're uncomfortable, we're, we're not sure we can uh, make this next part happen. What happens in our brain is it sends, a, the emotional center sends a charge down into our bodies. It's called a somatic marker. And it makes us feel something. It makes us feel differently than we did before it happened. If it's a negative emotion, that physiological feeling is going to be discomfort. It's going to be uneasiness. You may even get a little short of breath uh, you may get nauseous. I've seen people do that. And so when that somatic marker, when it causes that physiological response and then combines with the logic that you're facing at the moment to produce a decision, the decision is to say no. It's to move away. It's to back off. It's to not move forward. But the good news is the opposite is true as well. Uh, you literally can, it, when the uh, a positive emotion is generated in, in that part of our brain. It still produces a somatic marker. It shoots the electrical charge down into your body and it produces a somatic marker. Uh, but in this case, it produces a somatic marker that we like. We like the physiological feeling we're having. It's a sense of comfort. Uh, it's, a, it's a sense of uh, this is a good thing. And it all comes because we've generated emotions like joy, love, a sense of belonging, a sense of trust. That's what creates that. Now, when that positive emotional response combines with the logic of what we're facing at the time, that's what I refer to as a fusion point. And a fusion point is that moment in time when logic and positive emotion merge and ignite. And when they do, it creates energy. It creates commitment. It makes us comfortable saying yes to the next step. So in the mix of what I teach people and what I'm going to teach you today is you can actually incorporate fusion points in every part of your sales model, from prospecting through the actual sales conversation itself, uh, through handling objections, uh, working with objections, and uh, even through building your team if you're a broker and if you're leading a team. And the way I'll, I'll go through a couple of things with you today that will be helpful. In the prospecting process, most people... When you make that initial contact in any sales in any industry, you're going to get people reacting one of three ways. 
The first way, you're going to get one group who they realize they have a need. They may recognize your brand. And when you reach out to make contact, that, that actually creates a positive emotional response and they link it with the logic of your request. You'll get those appointments because you're creating a fusion point. I wish they were all that easy, but as we all know, they're really not. But that group that knows they have a need and recognize you, it's, you're going to move forward. Unfortunately, there's two other groups that are a little bit more of a challenge. You've got one group that you know, the an, an initial contact by a salesperson in any industry, uh, they considered an interruption to their day if they weren't expecting the call. Uh, they look at it as an annoyance. It creates a negative emotional response in their brain. It creates the collision point we mentioned earlier, and that person is going to push back. They're going to say no. They may hang up. They may be even slightly rude. And then you've got this third group. This third group, they don't have any thoughts about you at all. There's no emotional contact. Uh, context. They're just focused on their day and their issues. And so in, when you make an initial contact with them, uh, they don't consider it at all because they're not thinking about you and you haven't given them a reason to yet. You can change all that by creating fusion points even prior to your first request for a meeting. Uh, the way I teach that in most sales models, and you have to tweak it a little bit based on your industry, but I teach a process where it starts with three positive emotional connections that you'll make with a prospect before you ever even request that first meeting. Uh, you can be something where maybe you find an online review. If it's a company prospect or an individual prospect, it may be something where you see something on social media about them, or maybe you go to the company's website, you're seeing different things in that arena. And when you, because you've done a little research, and as our friend Art Subject says, instead of having a cold call at that point, you're having a smart call because you've done some research ahead of time, you can send something to them that brings that out. Uh, it could be uh, just a, a comment where you print off whatever you saw, you put a handwritten note on there, you get it in their hands and say, I just saw this, I thought this was awesome. Then add two sentences to the end of that message. Number one is, I would like to meet you soon. And number two, please expect my call. Then you do a second touch with them. And that could be anything that you find that you think they would find valuable. The key is it needs to be something valuable in the eyes of your prospect. And if you're in real estate, your prospects have such a varied area. It may be something that anyone who owns a home or wants to buy a home would find valuable. So you're going to send that second touch that way. A third way is to, to you, I, I like these uh, services like Kim works with where uh, you could actually send a greeting card that you upload a picture from that that would mean something to that prospect, either from their social media profile or from uh, their uh, business profile. And you can literally send them something with an image that means something to them. And you can type uh, the message in and the, the card company will send that out with your message. They'll have something in their hands that came from you. Well, when you've done three things where you've uh, where you've provided value in the eyes of your prospect, you're going to create positive emotional touches every single time. Then when you actually invite them to visit with you for the first time, they're going to combine the logic of what you're wanting to visit about with those emotional touches and your percentages change. That first group where you were going to get the yes either way because you showed up at the right time and then they knew they had a need, you're still going to get all of those. You may even get a few extra. You show up at the right time, it's going to be good. But in that second and third group where you really wouldn't have gotten their attention or you would have gotten negative attention, when you create those positive touches before you reach out, what you're doing is in essence setting the stage so that more of those will actually respond. Those who had a collision point, it will soften about that because you've sent something that they enjoyed. Uh, those that have no reason to think of you suddenly have that reason. So as you're, as you're working through your prospecting process, that's the goal is to create that connection so that when you ask for that first visit, they're more open to do that. Fusion points will do that. And there's ways to uh, incorporate fusion points in your sales model itself, a conversation uh, one of the things that I absolutely love about Bob's work on objection proof, which is kind of the subject matter we used for our latest book together, it is so built in such a way that it creates fusion points in so many parts of it. It creates relationships. It creates that bond. 
And what we learned, what I learned as I did the research behind the neurology, I had learned a lot of things about the psychology of sales over my career. I'm not mean, studied great authors on the subject wanted, because I wanted to know. And I knew that, okay, this works better than that. I didn't know why. But once I began to dive into the neurology of the brain and then understanding why that happens, it gave me the ability to adapt in almost every situation and cause those fusion points intentionally. And that's what you're looking for. So anyway, that's enough for me. I'll give it back to Bob. We love being with you guys today. Thank you, Jeff. That was awesome. Appreciate you. I learn more about that every time I, I hear you. Um, up next, and I apologize, it's it's actually a little later than we thought, so she's uh, going to have to edit a tiny bit, and I apologize for that because she's so wonderful. I hate to take up a, a, even a second from her. Kim Angeli was a uh, salesperson back in the day for Cisco Systems. Her production was, I guess, okay. She was a $65 million <laughs> producer. Wow. Uh, after she retired from that, she she took over her parents' uh, insurance uh, agency, which was struggling for some reasons that were outside reasons, and she saved the company and built it into a powerhouse before retiring. And now she basically shows people a system and this system, uh, and it's much more than just the cards, believe me, it is a total system to keep yourself again, not just top of mind, but top of heart. So Kim, go yeah. ahead. And I apologize for having a cut. You're you good. Bit, but we'll, I'm sure we'll have even questions and answers that, that we'll address again. So go right ahead. I set my timer. So I um, actually went to a, an event, a real estate event two weeks ago, and I heard a statistic on stage from the top agent in this um, conference that 83% of real estate agents never reach out to their customers beyond the closing table. Hmm. How many of you know that? Well, I'm a living example right now. I'm sitting in my client's conference room because I just moved Monday. Yay me. Who loves moving? No one. Um, from one of my largest assets into a smaller home. I'm an empty nester. And I'm going to um, say that 11 years ago when I bought that house, I had a fairly nice experience buying the home, moving into an area where I only knew one person. And I if I wanted to call the real estate agent who helped us with that transaction in 2013, I have somewhat of a problem. I don't know her name, right? So I, if I didn't have any relationships with other real estate agents, which I do because I do coach real estate agents around the country, um, I would not have been able to pull up my phone and look for her name because I've never heard from her beyond the closing table. So what I teach in my process and my blueprint is we, even myself included, we sit here with a gap in our own business beyond the transaction. I'll raise my hand that I'm one of those. There are some customers I could reach out to that did business with me in the past. And so 68% of people do not do business with you again or send you referrals because they feel like you did not care about them. They don't feel cared about beyond the transaction. So they either never call you again or they forget about you because you're not staying top of heart beyond the transaction. You might do the closing gift or do the welcome basket the first year, but what? how are you staying top of heart the second year, the third year, the fourth year, the fifth year, so that you can be the, the trusted resource for that person you've already helped. Because how many, you can raise your hand or just put in the chat, love referrals from past clients. How many of you love for your phone to ring? And you're like, oh my gosh, it's one of my favorite customers. And they are just handing you a person because they are a brand ambassador. We love those. Why do we love those? Because here's the bridge of trust. And a lead is not even on the bridge. But when someone refers you, they've gotten them halfway on the bridge of trust, right? It's your job as this real estate professional, roofer, whatever you're doing in your business to get them over the bridge of trust to get to the sale. 
but we love word of mouth referrals. But if I can't remember your name, because I don't know, it's very difficult for me to refer you. So I focus on after the sale. How, how do we become unforgettable in a very noisy world, mm -hmm. in a very noisy world? So I'm going to give you an example of a case study I did with a client in L.A. who was like, Kim, there's so much stuff. You know, there's Facebook, there's TikTok princess, there's Snapchat, there's LinkedIn. Like, what do I do to really like get my phone to ring with more valuable referrals so I'm not chasing leads, right? I don't want to chase leads. I don't want to door knock. I don't want to do those things. I want to really get qualified referrals from people I've already served. And I said, well, there's a process to that. And I have the recipe for it. And so we put this, I made her get her probably last 24 months of transactions or, you know, closings and things, she listings, buyers, all those things, the ones that she liked, right? How many of you have gone to a closing table and um, you hope you never see that person at a closing table again? <laughs> we don't we don't reach back out to them because guess what? Grumpy people have grumpy friends, right? Birds of a feather hang out together. So if someone didn't value you as a real estate agent through the process and you dragged them to the closing table, their friends also might not value real estate agents. And this is the same with insurance. Cause I say, I'm a want to be real estate agent because I feel kind of people love insurance agents. Uh, we're a little lower, you know, in the totem pole. So I worked with Debbie and she's in LA and she's a rock star real estate agent. She hates social media. And when I say she hates social media, she never gets on there. So she wanted a way to be a top producer still and get away from the shiny object syndrome. How many of you believe there's a lot of stuff out there we can choose from? And she said, I really want a simple system that brings referrals that I love to me. So I said, okay, so let's re-engage with your past client base that you like right? You found them fun. They were revenue generating and they found that you were valuable. Like they checked the boxes. So we did. So of course she was doubting Debbie. That's what I would tell her. She's like, well, I don't think this is going to work. I've sold them a house on average. They're not going to need a house for seven to eight years. I said, just run with it. And I said, guess what, Debbie, if this doesn't work, my guarantee is that I will pay for whatever gratitude strategy we deploy." I will pay for every dime we spent on what we send out. And she's like, okay. So we sent part of my process. We sent out and we re-engaged with her clients that she loved and she got three listings. So of course we get on the zoom call coaching because I've never met Debbie in person. She's in LA and she's like, why did that work? And I said, well, she said that wasn't from the actual person I sold the home to because I just placed them in a home. And I said, well, Debbie, these people have friends. And all of us have influence other, over other people, right? We all are, we all have, we're, we have raving fans and people that trust us in our own networks. And so if I can't remember your name, but suddenly you're re-engaging with me and I go to a neighborhood barbecue and somebody says, I'm about to sell my house, you were top of heart and top of mind. And so that your name is now resonating with them because you've kept in touch with them. And the key word in all of this is consistently. What is working for you when you're working? What can you put in place that's going to work when you have five to six houses coming up this summer, like my real estate agent. She has four or five listings coming up this summer. She doesn't have time to think about it. She needs a system. And so that work for Debbie is reaching out and being that person. We have tons of money on the table with our past customers that we've served. And a lot of us are spending energy in chasing leads we're chasing leads. We're chasing shiny. So my homework for you on the call is to see what are you working on and where did your last five customers come from?
right? This is your homework. I want you to take a piece of paper out. I don't care what it looks like. I want you to write down your last five customers that you worked with that check these boxes. Again, were they fun? If you saw their name pop up, would you like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to answer. They were fun. They were revenue generating and it's duplicatable. Like it's someone else you would like to serve because they hang out with people like themselves. A lot of people hang out with people that are amazing. And where did they come from? I want you to connect the dots. Where did they come from? Was it a word of mouth referral? Was it a TikTok video? Was it a Facebook fairy post? Where did it come from? And do more of that and then follow up and stay top of mind and top of heart with your past clients. I even teach gratitude calls. And if you want gratitude calls as a resource, you can email me, ask me for them. Even calling into your past client spheres of influence database will make you top of mind and top of heart. And you can just chunk it down once a week. You're calling into past clients, calling into past relationships and keeping yourself top of mind and top of heart consistently. Because all of this works. Door knocking and cold calling, they work if you're consistent. But I believe that relationship building, just like Bob and Jeff say, relationships long before I'm gone, 100 years from now, will still be around. We will still be doing business with people we know, like, and trust. And I have eight seconds. Thank Kim you. Angeli, be unforgettable in a noisy world. Wow. Well, you can see why I love Kim so much. I just, you know, I listen to her and it creates a fusion point. I mean, she's just so, so wonderful. So thank you for having me. And my apologies for that. We, that her, that her time got cut short. Anyway, uh, Kevin, let me send it back to you. I hope everybody enjoyed uh, uh, the information. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny. I got a text message from someone on here said, it sounds like it's me talking the whole time. Because <laughs> these principles are, are all stuff that has connected in things that I've um, instilled in my business. I used to actually do a gratitude coin that had numbers on it and we would mail it to people and ask them to then mail it to someone and write a letter and then it would have a tracking number and you can go to a website and actually track the coin and see where it's gone all over the world. Wow. Um, and, and I probably did that, I don't know, 25 years ago. And uh, so it's just great stuff. So real, really, really fun. Um, and I know you have an event coming up, which we can talk about in a minute. Yeah. Um, does anyone have any questions for, for, for Bob or Kim or Jeff? Um, if you do, you can unmute yourself. I think you have the power to now or raise your hand and I can unmute you if you can't. I, I have one question for Kim. Yes, Doug, go ahead. Kim, hi. Uh, thank you. So there was... Um, you wanted us to list the last five customers, right? It was fun, revenue generating. Where did they come from? And there was one more. What was the last one? I missed it. Um, is it, is it, is it, rev, joy, did they bring you joy, revenue, and where did they come from? Um, like, where did, where did you spend energy to get them? Okay. Spend more time there. When I work business with a business owner strategically, a lot of us, including myself, I mean, I wasted $40,000 on a click funnel one time at Bandcamp. And so basically we are chasing shiny objects. And so I want you to st strategically look at where did the last five customers come from? And if it, there's a thread that runs through it, that's, you know, the same, spend more time there. It might be Facebook. It might be a networking group you're in, but a lot of my people are like, I'm going here. I'm going there. I'm networking. I'm like, where did you generate revenue? Awesome. Where did you have success? Do more of that. Spend more energy there. Awesome. Thank you. Hakeem. Thank you all for this. This was fantastic. Thank Bob, you. I'd love to ask you a question if you don't mind. Sure. Um, around, around mindset, actually, and what sort of mindset's required to, to show up in the way that you're describing, especially for someone who's maybe more introverted. First of all, Hakeem, being introverted is actually a strength. Yeah, I agree. It really is. And here's why. You know, and I I was at a Dunkin' Donuts uh, one time. Well, I'm always at Dunkin' Donuts. But uh, there was a, 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 where I was in line. Little boy's talking and he's talking and he's talking and he's talking. And one of the, one of the people uh, in line says to somebody else with kind of a wink and a nod, that kid will be a great salesman one day. 
The premise, false premise, if I may, is that because someone can talk and talk and talk and talk, that they're going to be a good salesperson. Now, can a person like that be a good salesperson? Well, they can if they're willing to stop talking and start asking questions and listening. Typically with introverts like us, because I am as well, we derive our energy uh, in much greater extent from not having to be on, <laughs> right? We love asking questions. You know, my feel good questions that I use, I developed those because I didn't want to have to be talking about myself. I wanted to quickly create a relationship, a fusion point, if you will. I just didn't know that's what it was called back then. And that's why I asked the quote when I meet someone new. It's when I ask the question, you know, how did you get started in the so-and-so business? Excuse me. Sorry. How did you get started in the so-and-so business? Let them talk about themselves. Let them invest 99.9% .9 of the conversation talking about themselves and their business because that's what they're interested in right now. What do you enjoy most about what you do? It's a feel-good question. It elicits a feel-good response. It's a fusion point, right? And then, of course, the one key question, Dave or Mary, how can I know if someone I'm speaking with is a good potential client for you, right? These are in. We ask those questions, um, uh, introverts, extroverts tend not to ask. Introverts want to talk and talk about themselves. Not all, by the way. And by the way, if you're an extrovert hearing this, it's okay. You just got to keep in, keep this in your consciousness, okay? And as Hakeem said, put yourself into the mode of being other focused because it's not as, uh, as natural. So ask questions, listen, really listen. And that's how you begin, begin the relationship. And you feel so good about the fact that that relationship takes hold that now it becomes a lot more natural. Great. Thanks, Bob. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right. Let's talk. Um, and then we can answer a few more questions that everyone has. Let's briefly just talk about the SalesWise event. I, I know you wanted to come on, bring value, but I would love for you to just let everyone know about that event in case anyone wants to go. I, I honestly will say anytime to get near Bob, obviously I don't know Kim and Jeff, uh, but I do know Bob for many, many years. So a chance to get near him and learn from him is golden. So what do you have coming up? Thank you. When, when it comes to, to, to Kim, Jeff, and myself, believe me, I'm the weakest link. So you want to get around these two guys. I just put in the... Um, I just put in the chat, the um, saleswiselive.com. Uh, this is a two-day event. It's local. So you can get to it by car. It's going to be held at the wonderful, exquisite Ben Hotel in downtown West Palm Beach. It is two fantastic days of Kim, Jeff, and me doing our thing. But that's just a start because it's not just us speaking. It's engagement with the audience. Uh, it's masterminding with one another. Uh, it's breakout sessions where we're all going to work on the things we need to do. Here's the basically what you're going to come away from this. You're going to be able to meet more qualified prospects. You're going to be able to set the appointments with more of those prospects. You're going to be able to increase your rate of completing the sale. Um, you're going to stay top of heart and you're going to earn a lot more referrals from people, both through Kim's methodology and also through my endless referral system that I'm going to share at the event. From now on, when you ask for referrals, you're not going to get the answer, well, I, I, let me think about it. And if I, if anyone comes to mind, I'll, I'll let you know, because we know what happens in that case. It never happens. So I'm going to show you how to frame. Again, it goes back to the frame, 90% of the way to your success. Okay, I'm going to show you how to frame the referral questions so that you help them immediately bring high quali highly qualified prospects to mind. I think what many of you have probably picked up on during this brief chat is that Jeff, Kim, and me, Jeff, Kim, and I have combined our three strengths. And what we've done our three areas of expertise, and we've put it into one system we call the SalesWise system. What is a system? A system is simply the process of predictably achieving a goal 
based on a logical and specific set of how-to principles. The key is predictability. If it's been proven that by doing A, you'll get the desired results of B, you know that all you need to do is A and you'll get the desired results of, of B. So on June 2nd at night, five to seven, we're gonna have a get together and there's gonna be a live Dixieland band. It's gonna be a lot of fun. But then prepare because on the third and the fourth, it's going to be two fun but very intense days where you're going to have you're going to take in information, and again, it's going to be experiential. It's not just going to be said experiential, and you're going to be able to leave with the wisdom to apply it right away. This is going to be a a, a conference with. Again, all very successful people. So there's going to be a lot of good success, uplifting, positive energy there. Um, and it's going to be small enough so that it's very, very, uh, what's the right word that I'm, you know, when it's small, it's uh, intimate. So it's going to be a lot of fun. So I hope you'll join us. It's at the Ben. Uh, go to the site, go through it. You'll see the two basic prices, $29.97 or $3,000 and uh uh, forty nine ninety seven or five thousand dollars. You can see the goodies that you get with each. Uh, and then what we're doing is um, for we're putting we've put together a group package where it's uh, twenty percent off. And so you just put in the code SWL twenty. And I'll just we'll just trust you that you're that you're doing it if you find someone else to go with. <laughs> and then just put in that code. Um, going to be so well well worth it to the point that we even offer a money back guarantee and i don't know how many conventions and conferences do that if at the end of that first day you don't feel this is absolutely going to drive your business to the next level you let us know and we'll refund your money right there awesome thank you very much does anyone else have any questions before we wrap up it's 259 you can unmute yourself raise your hand speak now Nobody. All right. Well, Bob, Jeff, and Kim, thank you so much for, you know, it's always nice when I get a call from Bob and, and we're always looking to add value to people. And most of the people on here know me and, and that's the premise of my entire business. Exactly. Basically that came from being a endless referrals consultant years ago, because I was broke, gave Bob my last uh, $5,000 on my credit card. And I tell the story all the time. It really, that training changed the the premise of how I see my business, how I sell to my clients, how I build my relationships and and living that go-giver lifestyle is uh has just been been great for the last almost two decades. So thank wow. you thank you to each and every one of you for taking the time. We'll have this recording. We'll send it out. We'll send everyone the link for the uh for the event coming up. And uh, again, thank you all for hopping on, taking an hour out of your day. I truly appreciate it. Hopefully you learned something new about selling, especially with this new NAR ruling. We want to know how to sell better to our clients. So you walk in the door, making them want to buy from you rather than you trying to sell to them. So thank you very much, everyone.